Welcome to our first Chief Data and Technology Officer Summit for the new year. I'm Caitlin Halfrey, Director of our IBM AI Accelerator and host of our summit series. Thank you to the 600 plus members that joined us in 2020. We now have a community of nearly 1,000 data leaders worldwide united around common objectives to share best practices as we turn data into business value, drive data, AI, and cloud transformation, and develop trusted relationships amongst like-minded peers. We as data and technology leaders have all been thrust into the spotlight as trusted data and the ability to quickly deploy technology solutions has become the focal point for key decisions we all face, employee safety and well-being, supply chain and operations, and sustained delivery of innovative products and services to our clients all while demonstrating incredible resiliency during the global COVID-19 pandemic and unrest of many kinds. My hope is that this community was and continues to be a trusted source of information for you, a place where we can hear from leading practitioners on how they are tackling these challenges and delivering solutions with trust and empathy. This year, we will run monthly, uh, starting with our session today, and we will cover topics including how we are adapting from last year and accelerating into the new year, uh, chief data and technology officers in partnership leading in turbulent times, getting students, fans, employees, and customers back in the building, building and creating trust in data, and balancing innovation and growth with risk and regulation, which includes best practices for innovatively applying AI for business balanced against regulatory requirements. We've sourced these topics first and foremost from your questions and requests, as well as close partnership with leading industry analysts and our own internal priorities. We have a packed agenda today, a unique opportunity to hear from several leading C-suite industry experts across financial services, retail, utilities and electronics. Thank you for making the investment of your time to join us today and share your expertise. Please do input your questions in the chat and make sure to share your opinions and feedback. With that, let me turn it over to our keynote speakers to jump right in. Thank you. Hello, I am Rob Thomas and I wanna welcome you to the Chief Data and Technology Officer Summit it is great to have you with us today. The number 6469, that is the patent number for the only US president that has ever been awarded a patent. And that was Abraham Lincoln. He was a boatman and he was working on solving all types of problems. And specifically for boats, it was around how would you lift cargo boats in the water so that you could get over a shallow area in the water. And Link ended up to designing different air chambers that could be used that would allow for the safe and the smooth navigation of boats. And he became the only US president to this date that's been awarded a patent. He lived in extreme times. There was uncertainty, there was sacrifice, there was conflict. Yet, he was able to prosper. And a lot of that time led up to the year 1870, which became known as the technical revolution, the technology revolution, really the second coming of the industrial revolution, which really set the tone for the years to come. We saw science accelerated. We saw technology accelerated. Sounds a little familiar to the times we're facing today. We've all dealt with extraordinary conditions and what we know through history is that extraordinary conditions can often spark innovation, spark transformation, and we can turn bad situations into opportunity. Now, we've all seen in the last year how AI has gone from a priority, something that many companies were talking about, to something that's actually mandatory. It's become necessary for companies to compete in a very competitive and in a very uncertain environment. And AI will continue to accelerate and drive disruption. And the companies that are using AI are going to have superpowers. They're going to be the disruptors and they can have a big impact on other companies that are being less aggressive in how they're moving towards AI. Now, leading organizations have to leverage hybrid cloud as they think about AI in their company. Why is that? 
Well, data is everywhere. Data is on public cloud. It's on private cloud. It's in your on-premise environments. Only hybrid cloud enables you to integrate that as a single environment. And what we know for sure about AI is your AI is only as good as your data. And that's why I like to use this term. There's no AI without IA, meaning information architecture, because you will not have a successful AI initiative in your company if your data has not been made ready for AI. That's what we've learned in the 30 plus thousand engagements that we've done around Watson over the last 10 years, data is critical. Assuming your data is in the right position, or if you just want to get started with AI, then it becomes, how do you bring AI to bear in your business? And unfortunately, a lot of the examples that people have for AI come from consumer use cases, things like smart speakers and photo recognition. But AI for business is actually very different. AI for business is really about three things. It's about language, and the term you'll hear is natural language processing. It's about automation, not only automating business processes, but how do you automate IT and automate the tasks that nobody really wants to do in the first place, things like data prep, metadata creation. And third is trust. Can you really trust the AI that's being used in your company to make the right decisions, to avoid drift from the intention of your models? So again, AI for business is really about those three things, language, automation, trust, which brings us to how we are thinking about software in this hybrid cloud and AI world. And we developed our thesis around the notion of there's really four capabilities that every company is going to need as they think about software for hybrid cloud and AI. One is around automation. Second is around security. Third is around modernization. And four is around how you make better predictions on the basis of your data. That's about getting AI to work. Think about these examples. Automate. This is automating business processes. It's automating how you run your IT systems, if you heard the term AI ops. Security is about how do you manage threats, protect yourself from threats, and modernize and integrate all your security tools. Modernization is about getting all your applications ready for this cloud native era. And prediction, it's about how you collect your data, organize your data, analyze your data, ultimately put AI into production. Now we've had some pretty stark findings over the last year. As we've seen AI accelerate, and we've been working with companies all over the world, it's really five use cases that have stuck out that AI is completely changing how these things are done in businesses around the world. If you're working on one of these right now, great. If you're not, I think you should be. And I think, in fact, anybody watching this, all five of these are probably relevant to your business. So number one is around customer service. And you can see some great logos where we've really transformed how customer service is being done. A really recent example for any of you Looking at the COVID vaccine distribution, we're working with CVS around how they administer that through using AI in their customer service channel. Next is financial planning. The COVID-19 crisis and then what that's meant for businesses in all industries, it's been about how do you do your financial planning, your budgeting? How do you actually use AI to do that more efficiently and productively? You can see great examples of companies doing that with us, companies like Ancestry, L'Oreal, as an example. Third is around employee experience, changing the way that you hire, train, recruit employees, how they can interact with the company using AI. IBM is actually a great example of this, where we've transformed everything we're doing um, around HR using AI. Also, companies like HSBC are doing this. Fourth is around regulatory compliance. Anybody facing regulations in your industry, obviously very predominant in areas like financial services, but also as you get into areas like oil and gas, telecommunications, AI can be your partner in how you maintain a regulatory compliant posture. 
And we've done that with companies like NetBank, Standard Bank are two examples. And then fifth is IT operations. And this is really the new frontier. This is AI ops, using AI to monitor your systems, predict outages, manage outages when they happen, because they all, they're all they always going to happen from time to time. We're doing this with companies like Sprint, Kaisha Bank, just to name a few. These are the dominant use cases of AI. And you can see in the data that I shared, over the next few years, 30, 40, 50% of companies are going to be having these use cases in production with AI. So we want to make sure that you're at the front of that, which is why we're sharing this information with you first. Now let's go to exa an example. GM Financial, early in the COVID crisis, they saw the need to transform how they were doing customer service. I gave you some examples on that before, but just to make this real, they're now using AI for 60% of the customer inquiries that come in. So without having to get a human involved, they can identify an issue, resolve an issue. Because they still have a customer service team, they're able to have the hardest problems go straight to that customer service team, which is why they're seeing an improvement in customer satisfaction, their net promoter score. Again, this is about AI giving employees superpowers, making them more effective at doing their job. And that's why I think this is a great use case that you can see here with GM Financial. So we are really excited about this series of summits that we're going to be running. In this one, first, you're going to hear from Interpol, who is the chief data officer for IBM. And I think you're going to see some great examples about how we're doing this inside of IBM that I hope will inspire you. Second, we've got a great panel today. We've got General Electric, we've got American Express, we've got Panasonic. And what's funny, thinking about these companies, to go back to where I started in my story, these are companies that have been around for a long time that continue to reinvent themselves. Think about it, Edison was really early in the timeframes that we were talking about became the formation of what became General Electric and led to years, hundreds of years of innovation at GE. American Express was founded around this time. And at that point, they were really just a money order business. And now obviously they do a variety of different things. Panasonic was founded shortly after this time period and has had many different chapters as a business. These are great businesses that you're going to hear from today about what they're doing with hybrid cloud, AI, and ultimately a lot of it's based on their data, which I know is a topic that's near and dear to many of you. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Hope you get a lot out of this session. Think about those five use cases for AI. We want you to be the first one to be doing that at your company. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob, for your insights and for kicking off our inaugural IBM CDO CTO Summit Series in 2021. And up next, I'm thrilled to welcome back and to reintroduce to the program the Global Chief Data Officer at IBM, Interpol Vandari. Welcome back to the show and to 2021, Interpol. Thanks, Dave. Happy to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. It's been a crazy year, given the unprecedented changes in 2020 and 2021, especially regarding the volatility of data and the challenges in making predictive models and forecasting. It's going to be a challenging year. So I would love to hear your thoughts on acceleration in 2021 in two key areas. One, obviously, AI, very important to you. And also number two at your global IBM CDA chief data office. And lastly, we'd love to hear your trends and predictions for 2021. So first up, how do you think AI will accelerate and change in 2021? Let me pick on one, one thing right, that I think will really drive 2021 uh, in artificial intelligence. I think it's going to be explainability. In the regulated industries in particular, uh, such as uh, healthcare, finance, banking, etc., you will see that the consumer-focused applications of AI, there will be an aspect of them that they will have to explain 
all the recommendations that they've arrived at. I think partly because there will be a movement. I don't know if there will be formal regulations uh, just yet or not, but I think people will be reading the tea leaves and they'll know that it's heading in that direction, that we will have to have AI systems that are fair, unbiased, et cetera. And then you, you're gonna to have to be able to explain the recommendations as well as justify the aspects of bias, fairness. Otherwise, people will not trust these systems, but I also think that regulators will demand it. Perhaps starting out of Europe, that's where I see things going. And I think that uh, those who, uh, who create AI products, they will read those tea leaves and they will move big on explainability. So that's what you'll see in 2021. About your office, the IBM Global Chief Data Office, what has your team learned in 2020 and how's the office going to accelerate into 2021? Our mission has always been to make IBM internally into an AI enterprise and then use what we do as a showcase for our clients and customers. And we've been doing that, as you know, Dave, for a number of years. What we've learned in uh, 2020 was that we could accelerate our showcasing of our experience with regard to you know, making IBM itself into an AI enterprise, uh, take that to our clients and customers. So we have, a, as, as IBM, now, now I'm also talking about all of IBM, we have a tremendous focus on the use of the IBM garage much, much more so than even what we had in the past. We've scaled that up. That's now spanning not just the alignment with the clients across all our business units. So they, they, you know, everything's being brought to a head in the context of the garage, but also our ecosystem. So the ecosystem partners will also play a role in that. And the garages will essentially represent the experiential aspect. So rather than just tell our clients what we've done, the garages will actually show them how to do it and how to apply it in their context, which is something that at least when we've been doing this uh, from our CDO, we've talked about replication, we've put forward all the collateral that we had, but we've kind of stopped, sh stopped short of actually showing people how to do it because we've said, you know, you've got to take what we've got applied in your context, uh, but everybody's context is a little different. In the case of the garages, IBM is actually going to show its clients and customers how to do what we've done internally, as well as what other clients have done. And they, they're going to bring that experience to where in an experiential way, I think greatly accelerate the projects for our clients by making use of the garage. Our experience has been, you know, uh, literally uh, several multiples, uh, you know, that uh, that it accelerates. And we've done this now over 3,000 clients. So we've got that experience. And we're seeing that there's a several fold uh, acceleration that is possible through the use of these garages. And so we're going to engage a lot more with our clients uh, through the IBM garage. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We spoke to your team earlier, and we'd love to get someone or some people from garage on a future program. Maybe we could get somebody in and chat about that in an upcoming uh, IBM CDO, CTO Summit Series. So I think that's a great, great idea, as well as perhaps some of our ecosystem partners. Exactly. What that, a great ecosystem. That would flesh it out really well. Yep. That's, that's a great, great idea. Uh, last question. What other trends uh, or predictions do you envision for 2021, Andrew Paul? Again, I'll focus on one or two, because I think that that's the best way to answer these questions, because then you can hold me accountable. It's very easy to tell whether I'm being wrong or right. Um, uh, but, you know, these are going to be fairly safe predictions. I do think that the uh, acceleration of workloads to the cloud, you're going to see that. And I think it's primarily going to be hybrid cloud because, you know, when it was purely a public cloud scenario, the adoption of workloads was really not as extensive. In fact, we knew that uh, it was less than, you know, 5, 10, 20, pick your number, but it was on the low side. And most of the workloads uh, stayed in either on-prem or private cloud or however it was done. But post-pandemic, I think companies have realized that the digital transformation is necessary and that the cloud is the way to do it, or at least it's the foundational piece that needs to be put in place. So I think there will be a big movement to cloud that will then be used as a foundation to launch the digital transformation initiatives across 
all major enterprises. I think the other prediction, as you see uh, that move to the digital transformation take hold and become uh, more extensive and scaled, the other aspect that will get a lot of focus is the security. Because it will be, uh, from a cybercrime standpoint, that becomes a uh, quite a rich environment for cyber criminals to uh, take advantage of. And so correspondingly, enterprises will have to really uh, beef up their security efforts and uh, automate much of uh, the security to keep pace with uh, the attacks and the ransomware and all the other stuff that these guys do. If uh, viewers want to look at our uh, previous episode on hybrid cloud, we did one with IBM last year on uh, hybrid cloud uh, use cases at scale. Interpol looks like a challenging, but an exciting year ahead. Thanks again for your insights, Interpol. And now I'm gonna move on to the panel. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining the inaugural program in our second annual IBM CDO CTO Summit Series. Next up for our panel discussion on how leading organizations have adjusted and adapted and are accelerating into 2021, I'm delighted to be joined by Danielle Kropp, the Chief Data Officer at American Express, Faisal Pandit, who's president of Panasonic System Solutions Company of North America, and our old friend Santosh Kudva, who's the Chief Data Officer and CIO for Finance and HR at GE Gas and Power. Let's get right to it with a lightning round. Let's start with Danielle. Danielle, what's your motto today if you were to describe it? Is it move fast and break things or slow and steady wins the race? I hate to be one of those people who says both, but it's both. And really it's about, you know, moving fast and breaking things where we can, where that, where it makes sense to, and where it's the right risk to take for the company and do slow and steady wins the race where we need to really make sure we get everything right. Over to Faisal, what's your motto? David, I would go with the first one, uh, moving fast and breaking things to a great extent, not always. Right. Uh, we have to make sure that we strike the right balance between speed and the quality of services that we deliver to our customers. These circumstances uh, sort of forced us to go with, uh, we'll go with the first, first option to a great extent, but uh, certainly we didn't want to take shortcuts uh, at the cost of customer service and delivery. But wherever there was an opportunity, we did move fast and break things uh, sure. as, as, we could, as we could find uh, uh, doable. Uh, so I would say the first one to a great extent. Thank you so much. And Santos, you've heard this question before, right? Uh, we asked you this back in January, and I just liked it so much. A great way to break the ice. Uh, but what's your opinion? Slow and, and steady. I'm, I'm going to be consistent with my answer. So it is still moving fast, break things. Yeah. Uh, with the aspect that our, our business should feel that we are moving fast, right? Right. But I think there are things that we do behind the things that has to be done deliberately where we have things like compliance and governance, which has to be managed effectively. So our business, our business should not feel the slowness. Yeah. Outcome should be faster, but we behind the scenes have to be deliberate in those things. Given the 2020 pandemic and civil unrest, the attack on the capital, travel restrictions, you know, you name it. How was your company's business affected by events in 2020? Let's lead off with Danielle. So we focused a lot in 2020, given the circumstances, on strengthening our service to our customers. So if our customers needed support, we pointed them to our enhanced financial relief programs. For consumers and small businesses, we were focused on delivering them relevant offers and services to help them make the most of their time spent at home, plan for the future, and help those small businesses get back into business. How about you, Faisal? What's happening at Panasonic? From oh, there was a tremendous level of uncertainty as we all experienced. A lot of disruptions in our supply chain, a lot of disruptions in our, with our customers. And uh, that created a lot of anxiety within the organization, as you can imagine. So one of the things we did very early on in this, uh, as the pandemic hit was, we wanted to eliminate that uncertainty as much as possible, especially internally within the organization. So we took a very realistic view, sort of the worst case uh, view of things. And based on that, put a plan together around, around ensuring that we can maintain our workforce as much as possible, ensure that we can maintain the infrastructure so we can continue to support our customers, which is very critical. We have a, uh, we have a tremendous amount of presence in the public safety uh, market. So all those clients of ours were out there from day one. They didn't see an impact in terms of yeah, the need for their need to be out there. And lastly, we wanted to continue to invest in our future. So with that revised plan, I think we were able to allow our teams to focus on 
the jobs at hand and focus on the end customer, which made a huge difference. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And Santosh, how did 2020 affect GE gas and power? There are two aspects to it. There is at a GE level and a gas power level, right? So when you look at GE as a company, our aviation business took a hit because of all the travel restrictions that had come in. So that, that impacted the company as a whole, and you would have seen it in the market news, et cetera, on that aspect. Our healthcare businesses specifically with kind of all the other medical things that are required, did their bit in terms of making ventilators, et cetera, to support this COVID issue. So there was a good thing that happened from the healthcare side. Coming back to gas power, the initial part where we couldn't travel, we couldn't uh, go to our customer site. Our main uh, bread and butter comes from servicing the gas turbines in the power plants. And without travel, those activities kind of slowed down significantly. But as, as we have been working remotely, specifically as it comes into the data and an, the analytics space, we have been a very strong proponent of self-service and we have to ensure that we are doing everything we can for our business users to continue to deliver outcomes remotely as much as they can by themselves. So as we kind of had been moving the needle, this kind of helped us get over this uh, challenging times a bit with lesser uh, impact in that sense. But uh, as you saw from the last earnings report, we are on the mend, we are slowly starting to uh, grow. Uh, and you see that turning the G as a whole happening. So some things uh, not so good with the aviation side, yeah. but as things will improve, hopefully by the end of this year, the travel will get back. We will we'll see, we'll be back. So given how 2020 affected your business, how is your company accelerating into 2021? Let's start with Danielle. So 2021 is for us a transition year. We've pivoted our priorities from, you know, really being uh, you know, focused on supporting our customers through this, through this uh, unprecedented scenario to, you know, investing in our card member acquisition, injecting more value into our products. Um, signing more merchant locations and building more digital and data capabilities because we want to enter 2022 strong and ready to go quickly. How about you, Faisal? What's happening at Panasonic in 2021 to help you accelerate into the new year? Yeah, if we look at the changes we have put in place during 2020 in response to the pandemic, we've learned, we've learned a lot. We've been able to question our past practices, basic things such as do we need to be present in person for every meeting? For every engagement with our customers, do we need to travel all the time? Do we need to attend every possible trade show? So things of that nature, I think it's given us an opportunity to rethink past practices, which would have been a taboo in many cases. So we're embarking on those changes at a full speed. We're not going to swing the pendulum in, in any extreme direction, but we certainly want to take advantage of what we have learned from a business process point of view and business practices point of view. So looking at establishing a hybrid model, whether it's work from home, whether it's travel, whether it's customer engagement. Other element which is important is the digitalization efforts, the digital transformation journey that we began a few years back. There were some challenges in any time you take a mature organization, a well-established organization and try to pivot that in a different direction, it can be challenging. But these can, circumstances have sort of accelerated that transformation. It has enabled change at a pretty rapid pace, both internally and externally. Our customers are relying more and more on digital tools for, for them to be more efficient as they conduct their businesses. Lastly, another point I want to touch upon is the change in uh, how we lead as leaders. We've talked about or uh, heard about empathy, uh, humility, connection with people being critical in the past, but this was a year where I actually experienced it. We had to experience it. In pre-COVID, the focus on the people was there, but it was, was not the primary focus. But during COVID, it essentially moved to the top of the list, many notches above other priorities. So at least at my level, in, personally, I think I have learned a lot. I have developed better connections with people. And that is something we want to build on, not, not uh, leave it as what it is, but expand on further as we move forward. Santos, sure. your thoughts on... Uh... GE accelerating into 2021? So basically what we, we were struggling last year was with our working capital. So last year we focused a lot on getting our working capital in order, whether it was processes, whether it was analytics, visibility, et cetera. So we were be able to turn the needle on that one. This year is about variable cost productivity. So we are focusing on a lot of cost aspects to see 
compare to more than, more than it launched. So as you think out the rest of 2021, we went through a big organizations change. All that thing is settled down. So now we are looking around the corner to see what are the new technologies, what are the new platforms that we need to look at from that standpoint. A adding to what Faisal said, there is an aspect of people that the empathy has increased significantly in this area, right? Not just from purely from the COVID situation, but also from things like the George Floyd situation, et cetera. So there's a big focus on diversity and inclusiveness to see. And that is also a big focus as we look at our team members and our uh, employee profiles to ensure that if there are any hidden biases and things like that, that we have to, to work through that, through the training, the culture in that space. The foundation is there. Looking around the corner is what we are focusing on to really speed up this year. Let's dig a little deeper. Danielle, you're a leading global expert in delivering innovative new products and services and managing globally distributed developers and designers and leveraging foundational data and analytics platforms, and most importantly, continuous optimization, all to scale and to drive growth. So given the volatility right now in financial services and the challenges in using 2020 data to make predictive models for 2021. I mean, what advice can you give the CDOs and CAOs and CTOs on the call who are looking to improve business outcomes this year through new product development and delivery and also continuous optimization? Yeah, I think on new product development and delivery, I think what's really key um, is spending the time to really understand the opportunity or challenge that you're trying to solve. Um, I think as humans, we have a tendency to want to immediately like take a simple constrained idea and then take it from there and solution on it immediately. I think it's incredibly important to focus on really defining what that opportunity is and some time and discovery and really focusing on that. Once you have it really defined and really understood what the opportunity you're trying to solve is, then start focusing on how to solution it and how to deliver it. I think we often make the mistake that uh, we're, we end delivering something that doesn't actually capture all the opportunity it could have if we spent the time to really define it more fully. On continuous optimization, I think it's all about data, right? As always, it's, it's about really making sure that you're, you're focused on the right metrics and that you're continually optimizing to those metrics and finding your opportunities and uh, delivering in small ways continuously. That is the hard work and you're an expert on it. I mean, we all look to you. Who do you look to as inspirations for continuous optimization or companies or individuals? I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's many companies that do this well, but I think the one that is awfully inspiring, I think for many of us is Apple, Apple right? Yeah. Um, Apple is always continually optimizing what it's doing, making better products and services from, from the insights that they learn and the design thinking that, that they employ. So I think that they're the one that stand out for me on, on continuous optimization. Absolutely. Great point. Hey, Faisal, over to you. It's just so delightful to see another chief digital officer become president. The CDO club is the only company that tracks CDOs who become CEO and president. We've tracked over 100. I think there's about 125 now. And for you, it's not the first time. You were president of Panasonic Factory Solutions from 2012 to 2018. So you've done this before, as well as being an expert in turnarounds and digital transformation across multiple business. My question is, before you became president at Panasonic System Solution in 2019, you were their senior VP and chief digital officer for a year. Can you share some of the key elements of Panasonic's digital transformation during those years? And what were the corporate goals and strategies? You know, did you align the digital strategy with corporate strategy, for example? Sure, I guess uh, the plans that I put in place were well received and I was told to go ahead and execute upon those plans. And now I'm, uh, I'm actually executing upon what, uh, we, what we came up with the last couple of years. But uh, let me step back a little bit and to sort of give you uh, the history of Panasonic. If you go back about a couple of decades, we're known as a consumer electronics company. Even to this day, many people associate the brand with uh, TVs. You can't buy TVs anymore in North America. So North America has pivoted towards a B2B model quite a bit for the last two decades. So we have a tremendous level of presence across various businesses. The challenge we have today is conversations that we're having with customers are changing now. For the last many years, the device has been at the core of the center of the conversation. You know, with the business that I had up 
we provide very diversified product portfolio, ranging from ruggedized devices in the mobility space to industrial automation equipment. So the conversations were, all, were always around the quality of the device and the capabilities of the device. But today, our customers are want to have a different set of conversations. How does this device fit into my broader ecosystem? How does it help me, me deliver efficiencies? We have a huge presence in the law enforcement space in our the ruggedized laptops. The same customers who we had, we have talked about the device for many years and couldn't you do so, also are talking to us about how can you help us reduce distracted driving? How can you make our officers safer? In our food service space, where we used to talk about point of sale systems for many years, today the conversation is, how can I manage demand? Coming in uh, into my store, I have four or five touch points, the drive-through, the kiosks, the front of the restaurant, the Uber Eats, so many other options. So how, do you, how can you help me manage demand? So it was extremely critical for us to change our model to allow us to engage with our customers in, uh, and meet their new set of needs. So there's three elements of that transformation. One is making sure we have the, the products and the services that can complement the device that we offer. So it's more of an ecosystem approach than a hardware specific approach where we bring in software and services around the devices. The second element is really our internal transformation, which is around making sure we have the right systems in place so that we can support this external transformation. And lastly, you've got to make sure you have a culture that supports this. You were hardware centering for so many years now to expect people to start thinking in an ecosystem uh, model or, or have a different set of conversation with customers. You got to make sure your culture supports and your people are ready to do that. But so far, we think we're making great progress. We have uh, in, made uh, significant investments over the last couple of years and we're on the right track. And of those three things, you know, the tech, the people, the, 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 the first one, what, what was the most challenging for you? Uh, I think, honestly, it's the, it's the people, the culture part. Yeah. Uh, you've got you, you've to give people enough time to understand the need for change. It's not like uh, this was a, a broken model where you have enough justification to come in and drive change. You, things are working well. Things are looking good over the next few years. And to sell the need for change becomes becomes a tough sell, but that's that requires a lot of patience and a lot of communication within the organization, which we have been doing. Fantastic. By the way, I've got a, a five mobile, you know, phone system here. It's Panasonic. And the one I use the most is the rugged one. You know, you got the, all those mobile headsets. Sure. Headsets, because we do, there's a lot of sports activities going on around here. And that's the, that's our go-to phone is the rugged one. It's indestructible. You know? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Great to okay. hear that. Hey, Santosh, so, uh, you know, I really enjoyed your comments at the Global CDO Summit in January, especially around how the pandemic came up with these little surprises, like, you know, the, the deployment of dashboards, right? Like they've always been the back burner item and suddenly like work from home and telecommuting, everything got pushed to the front of the agenda. So we're seeing the deployment of these uh, the data and analytics dashboards uh, pretty prolific out there to evaluate ROI for our data and analytics program. So I was wondering, you know, since, since you brought it up in January, Let's dig a little deeper. You know, are, are you using any particular dashboards? Um, what are you measuring? And for example, what's your definition of success? And I guess just broadly, what value are you seeing from the use of your data dashboards? So specifically on that one, right? And this is something that has is coming across the organization top down, right? Rally, uh, Larry Kalp, who is a CEO of GE, uh, believes in daily management, okay? So we have a concept where we are using the Ocean Canary matrix along with all what is defined as the KPIs and TTIs on measuring those. So we are calling them as the bowler matrix. Uh, so like you have a, in bowling, you have a thing that keeps on tracking. So the organization has defined the set, set level of KPIs that are being tracked on a monthly basis, okay? So that is becoming the, piece that is used across the organization for us to rally around. And this is not just about the dashboard that is used, but it drives a bunch of other activities. For example, the other thing that you will see from Larry is lean. So we are driving a lot of lean activities because one of the things that we are trying to drive is drive variable cost productivity, et cetera. As you look at those metrics, you have to really lean the process. And as part of the lean, there is data inputs that go into the lean process and the lean Kaizen workouts also will come out with 
what analytics, everything you need to support those lean activities. So as you think about KPIs, uh, or we call as also as TTIs, which are uh, targets to improve, so those are the metrics, and then coming with lean activities to ensure, uh, ensure that we accomplish those targets and all the analytics that is required for us to as inputs or outputs of the process to work through. So that is, that is kind of the focus area as we go into uh, the rest of this year. And who drove it? You know, was, was it the data and analytics people driving the deployment of the dashboard or were the other people in the C-suite or even the CEO saying, you know, we want more insight into ROI on our data and analytics programs? Who's driving it, the deployment? I, I think, uh, so on this one, this was, this was a top-down approach where Larry, as he did his business reviews and then our CEO Scott Frazik was doing the within business reviews has been looking at those metrics, right? And the expectation is that the sub-business leaders are really on top of that. So it is just the, the culture of the organization changing from the previous days where that is driving like, hey, we want to do daily management. We want to understand what is happening, right? So as you, as you walk the shop floor, as you uh, understand what outages are happening at the field and you're repairing a, a gas turbine, having those metrics is very super, uh, very critical. So that drives us where people are, are now realizing that, hey, we need data to deliver our outcomes and they are, they are continuing to push on us, right? So mm -hmm. earlier, like three years back, et cetera, I used to go and sell analytics to say, hey, we can do these things for you and this is how we can. I can I'll have to drive, drive an ROI pitch and all of that stuff it is no longer the case. It is where the business is pulling on the demand from us. Hey, we need this, right? And we see that that culture change has happened within the organization where data as an asset is now a critical, what I would say, objective within the overall IT space and, and, and as well as the organization. That's fantastic. You know, uh, I know again, it's off piece, but I'm wondering, Danielle or, or Faisal, do you, do, are you using dashboards or some way of, you know, calculating ROI on your data and analytics programs at American Express? Absolutely. So it's, it's done in, in pretty much every area of the business with metrics that are appropriate to that particular area of the business or even process for the company. So, you know, data and data-driven decision-making is completely embedded within American Express. Yeah, in our case, a key part of the discipline, but some are in initial stages of adoption, but certainly there's awareness, more awareness than it has have ever been. So great. Thanks to you all. And maybe one last lightning round question for you all. This is my genie question. You know, you didn't get this one, Santosh, but if I could grant you one wish, right? If, if there was one thing that you could get overnight that you know would just improve business outcomes in 2021, let's get rid of all the restrictions of time and money and personnel and approvals. But you know, what would that one thing be for you? What's your big wish for 2021? Let's start with Danielle. Okay, so I'm gonna take this two different directions. One is on the business side and one is more in the world at large. At American Express, like, you know, we have this fantastic history, right? We were the first to run a MagStripe transaction over a network in 1972. That means our data landscape is highly complex. It has lots of different legacy systems as well as modern systems. So if I could have my wish, I could wave my magic wand and modernize everything like that, okay? On the other side, with the world at large, it would be just for everyone to spend a little bit more time exploring and understanding different backgrounds and perspectives um, just to make the world a better place. How about, uh, how about Faisal? Uh, what's your big wish for 2021? Yeah, I'd keep it simple. If I could, uh, if I could have a vision to come true, I would be... I want to get back to the office and have uh, be in a position where we can have interaction with the teams. I'm a big believer in human interaction. The, the virtual thing has, we've kind of made it work, but I think great uh, deep discussions are critical for creativity, for innovation. And uh, there's certainly a need for face-to-face for -face interaction uh, with the team, with the customers, so that we can, uh, we can move forward. Great. Over to you, Sam. Sam. What, what is your big wish? If I could grant you a wish, Santosh, what's your big wish for 2021? I think, yeah, getting back to work, as Faisal said, <laughs> that would be very much a uh, uh, thing. But stepping back or thinking through this, right, is that 
I'd, I'd published an article in LinkedIn about data science and the value that we get from the data science, right? And you'll see in that article, like when we started this journey back in 2013, uh, we might have done so many data science projects. We had good data scientists, et cetera. And we find that only a handful of them have been operationalized today, okay? And it is not because of we don't have the technology. It is not because the data scientists have don't have the skill sets or expertise. It is because of data quality. Okay. We are, I would say we are leaving about 90, 95% money on the table because of data quality issues. Wow. Yeah. Okay? So that is what we are very much focusing on this year. This is actually part of uh, a K, uh, like a critical KPI that uh, the CIO is measuring for all the CIOs across the business on delivering certified data quality data sets, okay? Which means that we have to ensure that we fix the data quality in the source, not in the analytics, mm -hmm. okay? Fixing the data quality in the source, which means that there has to be a process change, a cultural change and ownership. So if you can help me get a magic wand, that does all of this. <laughs> that's that's my wish for uh, yeah. 2021. Well, I'm no genie, but I hope all your wishes come through. <laughs> that's a you know, data quality is critical. But I, but I also love Danielle's thought about you know getting out of our own heads and and meeting other people and trying to have understanding of uh, ideas outside of our own. Uh, so uh, very good, great wishes. I hope they all come true for you. So, you know, what a great session. I want to thank you all so much. We know how busy you all are. And I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to share your thoughts and these insights with your peers on the call. So our guests can answer them in the live Q&A, which is starting right now. All right, welcome back everybody and uh, welcome to CDO Club World Headquarters here in Long Beach. Boy, it is a gorgeous day today out there. Uh, I can't wait to get out there, but first let's get right into the live Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to have our guests join us again, Danielle Faisal Interpol. I think Santosh will be here soon. Uh, first question for Danielle, we got a great question from Abhishek Mittal, who's VP of Data and OpEx over at Walters Kluwer, shout out to Walters Kluwer. They bought my first company back in the mid nineties after we took it public, uh, they took it private. So uh, Abhishek's question for you, Danielle, is how is your approach to innovation changing as you plan for 2021? I think that given the new company is, uh, you know, pivoting from a very customer, you know, concerned approach in, right, in, in 2020 um, and moving through 2021 as a pivotal year to drive growth into 2022, um, that the you know that the focus on innovation is more is, is focused more around the enabling of the the uh, the growth objectives for the future. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next question, we got a question from Bill and Melinda Gates for Faisal. Okay, well, it's not Bill and Melinda Gates, but <laughs> it's from uh, let's see, Jeremy Foreman, who's director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Faisal, he would like to know, how are you addressing inclusivity at Panasonic as a lever for, in, uh, for acceleration in 2021? Uh, that's a great question. It's a, it's a very important topic to us. You know, it's been a strong focus for us, DEI overall, for the last many years as a global company. But COVID, I believe, amplified that significantly. Given the level of disruption, uh, the fact that nobody had experienced this before, it was critical that we come together as an organization to draw upon each other's ideas and experiences and, and find ways to manage things. In many ways, I would say inclusivity became a necessity. Uh, there was no rule book in place. So it was important to engage at all levels. So put a lot of effort in trying to bring people together. And uh, that helped, uh, you know, in... Uh, driving broader participation, it made leadership more uh, approachable. It kind of debunked the myth that uh, strategy setting and organizational planning uh, belongs to a select few. So it drove a, a significant level of participation in the organization. And uh, on top of that, we had open and uh, difficult conversations uh, around the various challenges we're facing and being both optimistic and realistic, which kind of helped build trust. So I think uh, that has driven a tremendous cultural shift that under normal conditions would have taken, uh, taken years. 
that has allowed us to put uh, put an implementation things uh, uh, that we talked about from a DEI point of view, which in the past was more of a corporate uh, initiative. Now it's become an integral part of the business. So I think uh, uh, long term, we believe that uh, you know if we, we'll continue on. These practices have kind of cemented into our into our day to day routine now. So we'll continue to build further on that, and it'll really help uh, drive innovation because uh, it brings more and more people to the table uh, with an open mind and uh, and, a, and, a, and a willingness to contribute. And most importantly, uh, with millennials and Gen Z, this uh, this would go a long way since uh, since we're actually demonstrating our intention. So very really excited about what we have accomplished on that front. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And you know, uh, we, our CDO summits have been supported every year since inception, since I incubated this uh, CDO club and CDO summit at a boutique executive search firm in New York City, Chad Gelleg, which is now Elleg Group. And Janice Elleg, for all you out there, females, uh, diverse candidates, uh, get in touch with her because Janice specializes in this. She's been doing this for you know 30 years helping to get women into the C-suite and uh, onto board director roles. So thank you very much. Interpol, I see you here. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, I think uh, there was one from Lori at Gartner uh, that I would really love to get to. So I hope we have time for two questions. Uh, she asked about the top three things every new CDO must do in their first 90 days. But first, you know, the sort of bigger question to sum up the panel, uh, Interpol. Earlier, the panelists shared what might be called, you know, silver linings coming out of uh, the 2020, and we're wondering what positive outcomes do you see for 2021? So um, I think I'll focus on a couple of things. Obviously, the you know the panel has uh, touched on many uh, many aspects of it. Um, I think, well, let me let me put it this way. I think the opportunity uh, is going to be around uh, digital transformation, the move to cloud. I think we'll see some serious workloads, you know, corporate workloads, business workloads, moving, uh, moving to cloud. And, uh, and I think that's, that's just because there's an awareness around it, but also a desire. And uh, the awareness is that it's super critical to have that based on, you know, just what we went through in 2020. But uh, so there's an opportunity there. And I think, uh, again, as, as leaders, data and technology leaders uh, being ready to ride that opportunity is, is a silver lining. I think the watchword though, that I would focus on from a silver lining standpoint is our people. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's well known that uh, the outperformers focus a lot on people, whether it be to gain their trust, whether it be to have them engaged and, you know, all kinds of percentages on that, you know, whether it's 90% more, uh, you know, outperformers will focus on people than not and so forth. But uh, the bottom line is the people are extremely important. And in these times, even more so, and I will give you a sense of uh, why I believe that. I think just based on what we've been through 2020, there's a lot of uncertainty. Also, a lot of people are now used to working from home. And you know, while we've heard that a lot of us are eager to get back to the office, I am gonna tell you, there'll be a lot of people who are not gonna be that eager to get back to the office. Yeah. And we have to be able to work with those folks, engage them, appreciate the different viewpoints, you know, as uh, Danielle pointed out in her uh, segment, uh, to bring them all together so that we can actually march towards getting these workloads onto the cloud. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't have that engaged workforce, it is not going to happen. So those are the two aspects uh, of the silver lining that I want to bring up. The silver lining, Interpol, I have to say, you know, in the very first episode we did last year, we were in the middle of pandemic. I think it was June. And, and you brought, we had the CDO of the Year Award winners with Linda Avery from Verizon your friend Anthony Scrivignano from Dun & Bradstreet, but one of the points you raised was how leadership styles have to change. You can't conflate the pandemic with civil unrest, with you know all of these things have to be separated out and you need to be flexible enough to have a leadership approach, empathy oriented towards maybe civil unrest, a little bit different toward pandemic, which might've been more data focused, but appreciate your sensitivity to the nuances there. So let's jump to, uh, anyone wants to see that episode, it was the very first episode last year. And uh, talking about, we came a long way, all of us in the early days didn't have the lighting quite right. I think we've all kind of figured out working from home at this point with Zoom. But uh, over to Santosh, because I see Santosh has joined us. Santosh, first of all, uh, just wanted to 
you know, uh, apologize because I see you did actually answer my question on the panel about who led the drive for these dashboards. And I asked it again at the end, but I'm glad I did now because in hindsight, you gave more nuance to, to the response. But the question from the audience for you today is how are you using data governance to speed up delivery of business outcomes in 2021? Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. so, so, David, I mean, as we, as I shared before, we have significantly increased the adoption of our data lake and analytics. I mentioned about our bowler charts and everything, which is used across the organization. Right now, we were now tackling the question on whether are we doing it effectively, efficiently, and keeping our organization safe. Okay. So when we are sharing these bowlers and so sharing with the CEOs, is there any question on the reliability of the data, right? So everything from that point to say, is the data, can we trust the data to the point of whether it is performance, designs, et cetera, to uh, including all the, all the regulatory compliance like PII, SOX, and everything, that all that governance is mandatory, okay? And what we have seen is that normally when we speak about governance, our business users equated to bureaucracy, right? And we had to figure out how to make governance invisible. It is mandatory, but let us figure out how to make it invisible. So we had to build solutions in this, in this space, whether it is metadata management, whether it is a glossary, whether it is data quality, master data management, all the things that build confidence in the data and keep us safe to make it much more invisible, agnostic, I mean, invisible to the users and automated, et cetera. So that is what we are doing where this allows the business to be very responsive in terms of driving their outcomes without being stuck in levels of bureaucracy to make things happen. Okay? That's fantastic. We are working on that, okay? Absolutely. Okay. And you know, Mike, most listeners might think that is counterintuitive. How do you use data governance to speed up outcomes? So a lot of people think of data governance as Dr. No, you know, and slowing things down. We've got a great episode coming up towards the end of the year on balancing innovation and growth versus governance and risk. So I hope you all tune in for that one. We've got a little bit more time. I'd love to get, we got maybe two minutes. We got three minutes left, but to, uh, maybe back to Interpol. Uh, Lori uh, Rodriguez, VP over at Gartner asks, what are the top three things a new CDO must accomplish in the first 90 days when creating a CDO? I'm assuming she means chief data officer function in the organization. Yeah, no, you know, this is uh, my fourth go around as CDO, right? So by now I have that answer down. It wasn't always the case, but uh, the top three things that, you know, when I, when I go in and this is typically you, if you're going into a, um, uh, a large enough CDO role, there's a huge technology component to it as well. So I'm kind of answering the question for both uh, data and technology uh, officers. Uh, the first thing is you, you've got to come up with your data or technology strategy aligned with the business strategy, which means you know how the company plans to make money, not necessarily how it makes money today, but the business strategy being how it plans to make money. And you've got to tie the data or technology strategy down to that business strategy very clearly, very well articulated, so that the senior leadership will, will adopt it, will support it, and then you know, help you push it, uh, push it top down. So, and, and that, that literally, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of complexity that goes into that because very often if it's a far flung global enterprise, uh, such as, you know, the one I work in, uh, it's very often that there's not, you know, full agreement and, and you, you kind of get put in the middle of that and you have to work through that. But then the, the, the exercise becomes one of aligning, aligning everyone. But bottom line, I believe you have, you know, maybe 90 days to get that strategy done and, uh, and also accepted, signed off by the senior leadership. And if you are unable to do that, then you really get into much more tactical mode of operation and the strategic opportunities lost. So that's why that's Absolutely. task number one. I Great. think the two other tasks that go with that hand in hand- I think we've hand, got about a minute left. Yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up. If it, uh, you, you've got to go after the talent to be able to execute on those technologies and those uh, data methodologies, which are, you know, this talent is very hard to find. A lot of people competing for that. 
And then uh, finally, the relationships with the business folks, both at a peer level, as well as at the senior level, at the business unit level, because they are the ones who help you understand what the business strategy is, but then even more important, they'll help you execute it. So those are the three things. Fantastic, thank you, Interpol. And, and thanks everyone again for joining us. And of course, most importantly to IBM for bringing these important programs to you. Don't miss April 24th, our next event, our next IBM CDO CTO Summit on April 24th is how CDOs and CTOs are leading in turbulent times. And we've got events coming up uh, every other month through the end of the year. So till then, please everybody stay safe and healthy. And I wanna thank you again for joining us. And you know, I know we're running over now, webinar may end, but I just wanna give a shout out to everybody who asked questions. So I may get cut off, but I'm not embarrassed about that. So thank you to Malo over at Krypton. Thanks to Grant Thornton and Gartner. Thanks to Diego uh, uh, and let's see, and Christine and Jason over at IBM. Thanks for your questions, Parul and Nick Flory, Rajiv Sharma, Dev Mukherjee, uh, Doug Morwood, Jose Cifuentes, Yogesh over at uh, Grant Thornton, James Latimer, David Pellegrini, and Rebecca Cooper over at Child Help. And everybody in the chat that submitted your questions, you know, an hour is not a long time to get to everybody, but we appreciate you asking all those questions. And I can promise you we're going to answer them. We'll reply to you directly. So thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you on April 24th.